Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us, episode 61, Skylab Wrap-Up. Last time, we covered the back half of Skylab 4, and with it saw the end of human occupation of Skylab. Jerry Carr, Ed Gibson, and Bill Pogue forever changed the interaction between crews in orbit and their support teams on the ground, and squeezed as much science as possible out of the space station's remaining days. With the safe return of the Skylab 4 crew, we've completed the third of three missions to America's first space station. But rather than immediately lurching into the next topic, we're going to use this episode to quickly recap what the program was all about, what happened after Skylab 4 went home, and what was Skylab's legacy. We'll also set the stage for the final mission before we introduce the space shuttle, the Apollo-Soyuz Test Project. Let's get into it. Skylab originated from the Apollo Applications Program, which was officially formed in the late 1960s, but had been kicking around for a while. It was made to serve a couple of purposes. The main goal was to investigate the possibility of repurposing Apollo hardware for missions other than landing on the moon. These ranged from a dedicated space telescope, a piloted flyby of Venus, and of course, space stations. The second, and perhaps secret real goal, was to provide something to work on for the thousands of engineers, both at NASA and in the industry, now that their work on the mammoth Saturn boosters was winding down. At first glance, efforts like this can seem like simple political pork, but I've actually kind of come around on them. Even if nothing came of Apollo applications, which is clearly not the case, it would have been worthwhile to maintain a center of expertise in boosters and rocket engines. It wouldn't make sense to say, well, sorry everyone, it's 1967 and we just don't need you anymore. See you around 1972 when we start working on the space shuttle engines. Teams would be forced to break up as everyone sought employment elsewhere, and you'd never be able to truly pick up where you left off when the time came. Institutional knowledge is really important. Of all the possibilities studied in Apollo applications, the one that went the distance was the concept of retrofitting a rocket stage into a long-duration space station. There was an extensive debate about whether a wet or dry station was the way to go. A wet station would mean flying a live booster into orbit and then retrofitting it into a space station. It was called wet since the interior would be full of propellant at launch and would still have some left in it when retrofitting started. A dry station would be unable to complete the orbital insertion on its own, but would be ready to go out of the box. After the challenges of EVA continued to be a concern, the choice was made to go with a dry station. But wet space stations remain an intriguing concept for the future. What resulted was a large space station made out of a converted S-4B stage. Normally, this was either the second stage of the smaller S-1B rocket or the third stage of the Saturn V. Instead, it would become the payload and ride on the last ever Saturn V rocket. The structure was dominated by the orbital workshop, which was the S-4B itself. Inside, the smaller oxygen tank was converted for waste storage, and the much larger hydrogen tank was converted into a large workspace. It provided a cavernous space for science and day-to-day life. Flanking the exterior of the orbital workshop were two large solar arrays. Surrounding it was a meteoroid shield, which also doubled as a thermal shield. Once on orbit, the meteoroid shield would deploy several inches away from the exterior of the orbital workshop, keeping it safe from little bits of debris and preventing it from baking in the sun. Atop the orbital workshop sat the airlock module, NASA's first dedicated space-based airlock. This allowed crews to exit the spacecraft without depressurizing the whole thing. Hilariously, at least to me, the exterior door of the airlock module was literally just an old door from Project Gemini. Next in line was the Multiple Docking Adapter, or MDA, a multi-purpose structure. First, as the name implied, it contained two separate docking ports. This was considered essential in case an on-orbit rescue was required. Inside was a large array of control panels lining the walls in all directions. One of those panels was used to control the last major component of the Skylab cluster, the Apollo Telescope Mount, or ATM. The ATM represented a huge leap forward for the field of heliophysics, the physics of the sun. By pointing its wide array of cameras and sensors at the sun, high above the interference of the Earth's atmosphere, 
scientists were able to learn much about the formation of solar flares and coronal mass ejections, which can have a major impact on technology on and around the Earth. It launched perched above the MDA, but shifted to the side once on orbit, allowing access to the docking port on top of the MDA. The large space station dwarfed any spacecraft launch to date. It would also shatter all duration records with plans to host three crews on 28, 56, and 56-day missions, with options to extend them. On May 14, 1973, the years of planning, training, and engineering came to fruition when five F-1 engines shattered the muggy Florida air as a mighty Saturn V lumbered off the launch pad one last time. Unbeknownst to flight controllers in the moment, however, all was not well. During ascent, the meteoroid shield came loose and violently separated from the launch vehicle. In the process, it knocked one solar ray loose and trapped the other with debris. It also nearly caused the destruction of the second stage when it prevented the S-2 skirt from jettisoning as planned. As the S-2 departed from Skylab, its small separation motors blasted the loose and partially deployed solar array, tearing it from the spacecraft and leaving a stumpy bundle of torn wires in its wake. Skylab arrived in space with inadequate thermal protection, one solar array unable to deploy, and another missing entirely. Its onboard temperature began to rise. What resulted was an incredible agency-wide engineering effort to determine what happened, develop the tools to fix it, qualify them for spaceflight, and train the first crew to use them. Work proceeded around the clock as all of NASA and even some members of the general public pitched in to save the stricken space station. Only 11 days after its nearly catastrophic ascent, Skylab's first crew, Skylab 2, leapt off the launch pad. An exultant Pete Conrad, commander of the mission, called out, We fix anything. And indeed they would. Conrad, along with science pilot Joe Kerwin and pilot Paul Weitz, embarked on a series of ambitious and hastily planned spacewalks to save the crippled station. First, they deployed a large expandable thermal shield through the small sun-facing scientific airlock. The so-called parasol was not a permanent fix, but it successfully ended the thermal crisis. Next, Conrad and Kerwin performed a hair-raising EVA to free the remaining solar array and manually deploy it. The Skylab 2 mission was not what the crew expected during training, but would go down as one of the most notable space flights of all time. They pushed the envelope on what was possible on an EVA, saved a $10 billion space station, and gathered valuable scientific data. After 28 successful days in space, the crew returned home. 36 days later, it was Skylab 3's turn in the spotlight. The mission was commanded by Pete Conrad's lunar landing partner, Alan Bean, with Owen Garriott serving as science pilot and Jack Lausma as pilot. While not as extreme as the problems encountered by Skylab itself, Skylab 3 also ran into some troublesome malfunctions almost immediately. During the rendezvous portion of the flight, one of the four quads of attitude control thrusters began to leak, forcing the crew to disable it. With only three quads, some quick thinking and some procedure updates were required in order to enable a successful rendezvous and docking. A few days later, a second quad began to leak, leading the ground to scramble a potential rescue mission. Though the rescue mission was eventually cancelled, it led to a fascinating space history what-if. While Skylab 2 had stabilized the space station's thermal situation, it fell on Skylab 3 to install a more permanent solution. The window shade or two-pole thermal cover was installed by Garriott and Lausma on a lengthy spacewalk, resolving the thermal crisis for the remainder of the program. The crew was struck by an early bout of space adaptation syndrome, or space sickness, and soon fell behind on their scheduled tasks. By changing their routine and knuckling down over their remaining weeks, they managed to not only complete all of their scheduled tasks, but forced Mission Control to come up with new ones. At the end of their 59-day stay, they had hit peak efficiency, and had deserved a well-earned break. In order to accommodate observations of the newly discovered comet Kahutek, the next flight didn't launch for 52 days. When it did, the crew of Skylab 4 was prepared to stay for the long haul. 
Officially, the mission was only planned to be 56 days, but after that, weekly extensions would be granted depending on the state of the spacecraft and the crew. Flying the mission was the first all-rookie crew since Gemini 8, Commander Jerry Carr, Science Pilot Ed Gibson, and Pilot Bill Pogue. With all Skylab repairs complete, the crew of Skylab 4 were able to exclusively focus on their science mission. That mission was altered somewhat at the last minute by plans to observe Comet Kahutek, which would be passing behind the sun during their stay in orbit. When the crew arrived, they found that like the Skylab 3 crew, they were having some initial difficulty adapting to space. Slowed down by the nauseating condition and sapped of energy, Skylab 4 also started to slip behind schedule. Inadequate training for late additions to the mission objectives didn't help the situation. The problem was further exacerbated by the quick tempo set by the Skylab 3 crew at the end of their mission. Reluctant to voice their grievances over the open comm link and come off as complainers, the Skylab 4 crew gritted their teeth, tried to carry on with the task at hand, and fell further and further behind. Eventually, the problem was too great to ignore, and Carr, Gibson, and Pogue had a heart-to-heart -heart with mission controllers over the air. After both sides clarified their positions and preferences, the mission was able to continue successfully. The early friction may have been regrettable, and spawned space-based urban legends, but it proved to be a valuable lesson to both astronauts and mission controllers. The mission also became notable for being the first to capture the initial formation of a solar flare from space. The valuable data Ed Gibson captured from the ATM console changed our understanding of the sun's behavior. After 84 days in space, the three men returned home safely. And then, we never came back. Now to be fair, the plan was to fly three crews, and three crews they flew. And by the time that third crew splashed down, the cluster was showing its age. One of its attitude control gyroscopes was dead, and the other was setting its affairs in order. The attitude control thruster system Skylab would have had to fall back on if that gyro failed was low on fuel, and the system was not designed to be refueled. Added to that were a number of more minor but still significant problems. The trash disposal system kept getting stuck, the thermal shield was functioning but wasn't exactly permanent, and the ATM was out of film. But you know what? They could have worked with that. As the great Zach Anner once said, No obstacle is too big, no mountain is too high, no volcano is too hot, and no Atlantis is too underwater or fictional. And besides, as I have recently learned in alarming amounts of detail, just because a spacecraft wasn't designed to be refueled, doesn't mean it can't be. And actually, there was an entire second Skylab. Because why build one when you can have two at twice the price? Skylab B was built as an engineering test article, useful for figuring out how stuff was going to work in orbit or for troubleshooting problems. But it was also a fully-fledged space station that could have had the finishing touches applied and used just like Skylab. All it needed was a little TLC and a ride to space. But these things take money, and they take effort, and they take attention. NASA had a shiny new space plane waiting in the Delta Wings, and for that program to be a success, they had to throw everything they had into it. Even outside the raw budgetary numbers, for the same reason that sending Gemini around the moon would have been bad for Apollo, figuring out how to send more crews to Skylab or launching Skylab B maybe would have been bad for the shuttle. At least, that's my take on it. It's not all bad news, though. If you enjoyed these episodes and found yourself wishing you could spend time on Skylab yourself, you can. Well, Skylab B. It's currently in the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., with a walkway cutting right through the orbital workshop. Though the museum staff may not like it if you try to stay there for 84 days. So when Ed Gibson closed the hatch on Skylab, it was for good. Soon after the last crew left, the onboard atmosphere was vented and major systems were shut down. Now that there was no danger to people, Control Moment Gyro 1 was spun back up to see if there was anything that could have been done to save it, and CMG2 was put through some engineering tests. But once the various engineering investigations were complete, the station was placed into a stable orientation, shut down entirely, and left to drift. There's not much air 400 kilometers up, 
but there's more than you might think. People don't tend to think about aerodynamic drag when they think about spaceships, but it's actually a major consideration for low Earth orbit. Over time, the tiny but steady pressure dropped Skylab's orbit more and more. The lower it got, the more insistent the forces became. At one point, there had been talk about maybe sending the space shuttle to dock with the ailing station. It could boost it into a higher orbit, and NASA would gain a lot of experience learning how to reactivate something that had been in space for so long. But the shuttle was delayed, and solar activity was stronger than expected, which fluffed up the upper atmosphere, causing Skylab's orbit to degrade even further, even faster. On July 11, 1979, it all came to an end. After traveling 1.4 billion kilometers over the course of 34,981 orbits, Skylab tore through the upper atmosphere in an uncontrolled entry. Unfortunately, the uncontrolled entry caught on in the media, and for weeks the impressive space station became the butt of many a joke as people wondered where it might land. NASA put the odds at around 1 in 150 that a piece might actually hit a person, but the odds were a lot better that it might hit a structure. My dad even commented that at the time he had hoped Skylab might hit his back porch since he needed a new one anyway and was happy to let NASA pay for it. The media frenzy was for naught, though. As the station first experienced peak heating and then encountered thicker air, it fragmented into countless parts. Most landed harmlessly in the ocean, but a significant number did land on Australia, where they thankfully caused no damage. And that was the end of Skylab. Over the course of 1973 and the early part of 1974, Skylab dominated the human spaceflight landscape. In total, Skylab was occupied for 171 days, playing host to nine men across three missions. Only 10 years earlier, NASA was celebrating Gordon Cooper spending 34 hours stuffed into a Mercury capsule barely big enough to accommodate his 5 foot 8 inch frame. Now each guy in the three person cruise had his own bedroom in space. Where we once were awed by Gemini 7 limping across the finish line after nearly 14 days, now we yawned as Skylab 4 passed a similar milestone with 70 days remaining in the flight. The three crews performed 10 spacewalks, including what I'm prepared to call the most absurd EVA in history, with Paul White hanging out the door of the Apollo command module, yanking on the debris trapping the solar array as Joe Kerwin held his legs and Pete Conrad tried to keep the CSM from crashing into the orbital cluster. Adding it up, all nine crew members spent a total of 41 hours and 51 minutes outside their spacecraft. During those 41 hours and 51 minutes, they broke new ground on what was even possible during an EVA. Crews were forced to improvise, get creative, and occasionally use brute strength to get the job done. Over the course of 171 days, hundreds of experiments were performed, the crew took thousands of photos of the Earth, the ATM took hundreds of thousands of photos of the Sun, and two spiders paid the ultimate price for science. But Skylab's legacy is more than a pile of interesting numbers. I've been thinking about this, and I've come to the conclusion that Skylab is a sort of anti-Apollo. With the Apollo program, you had an insane amount of attention. The world stopped when Neil Armstrong set foot in the dust at the Sea of Tranquility. It was then and remains now a story that resonated with humans at a deeper level. A hero's story of exploration and danger that all cultures share. Even today, when people think of NASA, that famous photo of Buzz Aldrin on the lunar surface is often the first thing they think about. Or Apollo 13's miraculous return. Or Alan Shepard playing golf. Or the lunar rover doing dusty burnouts. Apollo is a fantastic story. But as we covered during the Apollo wrap-up, its concrete contributions are likely less impactful than the intangible aspects of the program. We learned a lot about spaceflight, but we didn't gain much experience in doing anything even remotely sustainably. We gathered a lot of science, but it was mostly an afterthought. And then there's Skylab. Most people I talk to have never even heard of it, 
or if they have, it's because it came crashing down into Australia. Where Apollo is known to just about every human on Earth, Skylab flies a bit under the radar. The space station was designed with science as the main goal, and it delivered on that goal, reaping countless results and data. Apollo also delivered on its main goal, but that was a goal largely political in nature. Skylab's long duration forced both mission controllers and astronauts to grapple with mission planning in a way that never really had to be dealt with before. By the third flight, the crews were acting with a large amount of autonomy when it came to accomplishing their objectives. Contrast that to Apollo missions, which were so short and so focused that they were often planned down to the second. I also call Skylab the anti-Apollo because when I look at how spaceflight operations are done today, I don't see the echoes of Apollo. I see the echoes of Skylab. It's an easy comparison to make, but today's International Space Station obviously shares a lot of heritage with America's first space station. Crews routinely fly for six months, or even up to a year in the case of Scott Kelly. The extensive day-to-day -day planning, always shifting based on what's actually possible, look a lot like the flurry of schedule updates the crew would wake up to find streaming out of their onboard printer. And ISS missions are all about being sustainable, going for the long haul. Using the lessons of Skylab, the crews have free time, they're given better training, and they're given extra time to figure stuff out for the first time. None of this is to discount the immense accomplishments of Apollo, of course. The concrete results may not have been the primary focus, but they're certainly important. And as I've stated before, I think the intangible results in both inspiration and national prestige were well worth the effort. Just think of how many kids joined the STEM fields thanks to Apollo, and how many seemingly intractable problems were tackled with that shining example to look up to. But in the last few months, I've come to see Skylab as the secret crown jewel from the early days of NASA. I'll miss my time with it, but all I need to do is look around at the space world today to be reminded of it. And if you enjoyed your time with Skylab enough that you're not quite ready to let it go yet, I can't recommend enough checking out the book Homesteading Space by David Hitt. I relied on this book to help me see the greater narrative, which is easy to lose in the minutiae of mission reports and I thoroughly enjoyed it along the way. Plus, there are a ton of fun stories that I just didn't have time to bring up, so definitely check it out. David didn't pay me to say that or anything, but David, if you're listening, I'd appreciate an iTunes review. While we were talking about Skylab, and actually while we were talking about the earlier lunar landing missions, the seeds of our next topic were being planted. The space race began as two superpowers trying to outdo each other on the world stage, with increasingly daring and impressive voyages into the final frontier. With Kennedy's bold declaration, America set its sights on the moon. But not too long after that, Kennedy actually began to consider something a little more measured and practical, a joint space station with the Soviet Union. Nothing came of it at the time, but it was an idea that would endure. Starting in 1970, formal plans began to be made for just such a mission. For the first time, an American spacecraft and a Russian spacecraft would meet up in space. It would require deft diplomacy, political wrangling, impressive engineering, and interminable interface control documents. Such a mission would be risky for both sides, but this time the bigger risk was more to public image than to the crews. While the space race was largely over, neither country wanted to lose face in such a public endeavor. Next time on The Space Above Us, we'll put a bow on the first volume of human spaceflight history and introduce the final flight of an Apollo spacecraft. We'll also introduce a rookie astronaut finally getting his first flight. You may have heard of him. Goes by the name of Deke. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. <laughs>